Mm. Now it's recording, right? Did you receive the message? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, so welcome all to this third session on our reading group on T6, uh, Lacrimae Rerum. Um, today, as you know, um, it is the second chapter uh, that we'll be dealing with. It's the chapter, a very simple and shorter chapter on Hitchcock films, um, Vertigo, Psycho, and so on, as you um, were able to, to read, I think. Um, I sent you, yesterday I sent you an English translation of the, of the paper, um, of this small chapter. Um, and um, today, um, Barbara Bergamaschi, she volunteered, <laughs> kind of, to uh, present something on this um, dialogue, on this conversation between Zizek and Hitchcock. And I think she has a PowerPoint to present us. So if you uh, are ready to share with us your thoughts, thank you. Hi guys, good afternoon. I will be the first, I was not expecting that, <laughs> but that's okay, no problem, no problem. Um, just a second, I will share my, my screen. Uh, keynote presentation, okay. Okay, you, you can see the, the PowerPoint, right? Okay. Okay, so um, hello everyone. My name is Barbara Bergamaski Novais. I'm a researcher and filmmaker. I'm also a PhD in literature and compared literature from the University of the Catholic University of Rio. I did a, a research, my thesis on an experimental filmmaker called uh, Peter Cherkaksky. He's also really interested in hauntology and then this phantasmagorical spectrality of the image. So reading the book uh, on, on Zizek uh, was really interesting also for my, my research uh, focus interests. So in this way, I'm bringing here today um, some relations that I, I try to create between the hypothesis and thesis of Zizek. And, and his analysis of Hitchcock, but also bringing up a little bit of, of my research on, on my interests. Um, so let's begin with, just to begin with a brief summary of the main uh, theme or the main hypothesis of the uh, Zizek essay. He will say that the first thesis of, of Zizek regarding Hitchcock is that his unique style can be identified not by the analysis on the content of the film or the structure of the narrative, wait, there you go, uh, but rather on the, ins the inscripture of gestures or motives that can be visual, material, and formal that repeat themselves in many different films. So for Zizek, um, these themes impose themselves as Hitchcock's symptoms. And in French, he re I, I read the French version of the posh book edition, and he will do a differ differentiation between symptom with the TH and symptoms with the Y, that's the English way of writing it. And if I'm not wrong, Lucas, please correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not a, a psychoanalysis, but he differentiates, differentiates symptoms uh, from symptom. Symptom would be more next to like an idea of phantom of desire and not necessarily there is a sense or a decoding or an interpret a right interpretation of a symptom, a sense behind it. Uh, it's more of a manifestation of in the body of uh, libidinal investments. So it's different from the idea of symptom because symptom that would be, there would be a, a, a right interpretation or a decoding that you could understand the, the symptom. So, but uh, in that way, Zizek would say that these themes or motive that repeats themselves in many films are symptoms in the Lacanian uh, way. 
uh, in other words, a formal configurations that condense his libidinal investments, qui hante sa imagination, and hante in, English, in French is to hunt that ghost hints that like uh, scares him as well. There's this idea of ghost as a desire, but also something that terrifies it, something that you're fascinated. There's this double, double ambiguity. So um, I, I chose to quote this, this um, excerpt where he says, L'oeuvre cinématographique de Hitchcock en fait est traversée par le même visuel ou autre qui persiste, s'impose à travers une étrange compulsion euh, dans un film à l'autre, dans des contextes narratifs entièrement différents. So, I'm sorry, here I'm trying to translate from English into French, but um, I think it's pretty clear in this uh, quote what, what's the main argument of, of Zizek in this essay. So, uh, in this presentation, I will try to create a visual college or a web of elective affinities, something Walter Benjamin called untimely constellation between Hitchcock's Zizek and Breton and Bataille that are true surrealists, uh, the main uh, thinkers and the heads of that con conceptualized surrealism, because I think these four motives that Zizek identified in Hitchcock are also motives that repeats in, in, in surrealism. It's kind of interesting to see how we can make this uh, correspondences. So the first um, the first motive it's the the idea of the hand, or uh, la main, a mão in Portuguese. So the person who holds onto another hand, so as not to fall, is the first motive in Hitchcock, and what Isaac associates with nidach common lesson, uh, that is the concept of letting oneself fall or the melancholic suicidal fall, or the drive to, to the death drive in a way, the, this desire to fall. Uh, and this uh, scene of being on the verge of an abyss repeats itself like a motif in many films, like, for example, The Man Who Knew Too Much, uh, the main, the most canonical one, Vertigo, the main character, this one in the center here, He's uh, afraid of heights because he has a traumatized experience where he almost fa falls and, and he almost dies. In North by Northwest, we have the, the scene of the abyss in the Rockefeller, uh, the Rockefeller scene. I, I, I'm, can you see my mouse here? Where, so here it is, North by Northwest. Here it is, Vertigo. Um, we can also see, it's interesting, how Hitchcock, he... Uh, and create his mise-en-scene with hands. He tried to show it with gestures, with hands. Um, here it's a scene of uh, the birds where we can see there are many close-ups and really carefully filmed uh, close-ups filled with significance uh, with the hands, right? Here, there's another gesture in the birds. It's almost like chore choreographical hands, really millimetrical. In uh, mise en scene, he also hit, Zizek will talk about the this idea of the menacing hand, the hand that uh, can protect and either protect or either kill you. So the hand there, there is this ambiguity in the the motif of the hand. Um, what else? I also I also think it's really um, interesting here in the scene of the saboteur in 1941 film where they are in the verge of falling, we have the close-up of the hand, and they are in the hand of the Statue of Liberty. So there, there is a kind of a, a mise en beam of references of hands that repeat themselves to a kind of reification here, the hand over the hand over the hand. So um, this is the first uh, correspondence I will try. Can you see this little yourselves you're seeing yourselves okay so i'll take this out. um so as we know the surrealists they created some poetic methods or games to free the unconscious from the shackles of the superego to use the Freud freudian ter term and the surrealists read a lot of freud and interpretation of dreams and so 
they try to make like this practical and technical uh, games um, and li literal uh, experiments with the idea of free association that comes from Freud and the automatic writing. Uh, one of the main surrealist topic is the idea of a disembodied living hand that has an autonomy over the rest of the human body. So André Breton, he will say that the, he will use this image of the hand that separates from the arm to describe the process of dépaysement that founds the basis of the surreal experience. Um, so here it's on, on the left, it's an example of um, automatic writing work. It's a drawing made by Andre, Andre Masson that Breton described as the result of the passionate hand for its own movement and only for it. Um, this is a work uh, from 1924. And here on the right, we can see uh, a sismo figura. That's a drawing made by the surrealist poet, uh, Portuguese Mario Cesarini, one of the most famous surrealist Portuguese poets, where he did this drawing while he was in an, on the electric tram. Uh, which incorporated this shaking hand and the inclinations and the topography of Lisbon. So it's kind of a self-portrait of the artist's body, uh, a drawing made with a flaneur hand that was not controlled, that um, would incorporate the accidents of the streets. And it's kind of a marriage of the hand and the mechanical movement of the urban transport. So. It's the union of the expression of the machine and the man at the same time. So we can also relate uh, this idea of mixing human and machine with the idea of an um, Heinrich uh, that Freud will get it from the short story of Hoffman Sandman that tells the story of a man who falls in love for a woman that uh, is ac she's actually a puppet and he can't realize she's not human. So the unheimlich, this kind of uneasy feeling, disturbing feeling, it's, it's when you can't realize if what you're seeing it's organic or not organic, or it's human or not non-human. It's alive or dead at the same time. It's a machine and an animal at the same time. So this uh, type of experience or feeling, it's something that the surrealists were always uh, trying to pursue as well in, in their, their works. Um, okay, next one. Just a second, I can see you. If anyone wants to say something, uh, please put the microphone on because I can't see you at all. I can see you the, the little video, so. <laughs> uh, feel free to interrupt me if you want. There are also several episodes narrated in Breton's novel, Nadja. The, it's a 1928 uh, romance where the hand appears as an omen or as object of mystery. So in the novel, Nadja, it's the main character. She's a woman and she's kind of a homeless, visionary, witch, uh, mysterious woman that randoms about Paris. And Na the Nadja book, Breton narrates his encounters uh, by chance with Nadja on the street. And Nadja always sees these hands. She says, uh, she sees over the banks of the scene a great hand that burns over the waters. Nadja also points to a sign on the street that shows a red hand with a raised finger and says, always that hand. Uh, this is a, that was a sign uh, for the hand of Fatima. Uh, the a hand, the image of a hand that refers to the divinatory practice of chiromancy, that's reading the future in one's hand, uh, as well as the hand of Fatima or Hamsa used as a protective amulet against the evil eye or bad luck that we find in Arab culture, also in Christian culture. So uh, in another passage, the author Breton reports the strange magnetism he feels when resting his eyes on women's sky blue gloves. He, he sees some gloves and he thinks he already had dreamt about them or seen them anywhere before. So Breton represents also this enigmatic strength of the hands in the Kiriko painting that we see here on, on the left. It's called the Enigma of Fatality. Uh, I know actually this one is the 
the chanson of love, but there's also the enigma of fatality. There is a like a red hand. The, the image topic of the hand is also in the Kirikou's paintings. That's also a reference for the surrealists. So also the college that illustrate the cover of Breton's novel, Nigel, this one you see here on the middle, uh, the edition of 1972 from Gallimard, uh, would be a self-portrait made by Nadja that feature herself as a female head under the shadow of a hand. Breton would interpret the image as a masked siren or a masked mermaid, silenced by the apparition of her visions. For the surrealists, the hands would be then endowed with a duality. While incorporating the bourgeois and capitalist ideas of productivity, instruments of an apath apathetic or soulless bureaucracy, they would also be able to bring out a surreal perception. Uh, the Portuguese surrealist also, Arthur Manuel do Cruzeiro Seixas, has this work that's an objet trouvé here on the right. It's called the hand, a mão. Uh, it's from the 1960. Uh, it's a mixture of a leather glove with spikes and claws placed in an acrylic box. And these strange objects mix the ideas of animal's aggressiveness, um, as in the leather skin, with the gesture and acts of writing. Uh, the claws are ink pen tips, and it summarized very well the principle of automatic writing, a writing without ties to the rational conscious, a kind of savage writing that at the same times that creates can kills. So let's get to Hitchcock. So uh, the ambiguity of a hand that sometimes censors, orders, organizes, and sometimes fascinates and disorients. It's also present in the work of George de Lima, this one here on top, on the left. Uh, George de Lima, it's a Brazilian poet, also had a strong connection with the surrealists, the French surrealism and was the one first Brazilian to work with photocollage. That's also a technique that the surrealists uh, created or try, uh, experimented uh, in the 1940s. And this photocollage of De Lima also brings the figure of the hand with the, it's the hand of Fatima with this um, drawings, uh, Arabic drawings, or it also remembers the idea of chiromancy. Uh, and it's called an invention of the police. Uh, in it, a living disembodied hand centers the man covering his mouth, preventing him from speaking. So the word hand finally carries the same ambiguity um, as the word mother in, in Portuguese, both em embody a female figure that is both threatening and protective, mother and uh, in, in Portuguese, sorry, mão e mãe, mão e mãe, it's really amorphous, it's similar. In French, mama and ma. Uh, Hitchcock's mother in Psycho, finally, is dead, but she also brings death in the name of her son's protection. Also, there's another homophony here in mère et mort, in French, ma, uh, death and mother. Mother does not authorize, censors, castrates, literally kills his son's her son's desire and libidinal investment. So here uh, we have the scene where we see the loving mother. <laughs> um, okay, next, uh, oh no, sorry, still have one remark here. The second motive, it's the idea of the visionary woman uh, that Zizek will say that it's the woman who knows, knows too much. Uh, this, feminine figure, uh, it repeats itself as well in Hitchcock, in many Hitchcock movies. This will say it is inspired by uh, Hitchcock's uh, daughter. And this is the case, for example, of Doris Day and the man who knew too much that she suspects this French spy since, since the beginning. John Fontaine and Rebecca knows about her husband's past and hides it away. Um, Mario Crane's sister, and psycho, she insists on looking for the detective because she, she feels something went wrong. Kim Novak on Vertigo, uh, she has strange visions, strange dreams. So they are really similar a little bit with Nadja, the woman in Breton's novel, because she's a woman that has visions. She has an intuition. She sees things that others can't. So this idea of a femme fatale, or of a femme de nez, femme uh, condemned, such as Salome, were surrealist muses, 
the, their intuition, sensibility, and sometimes even cruelty would be the incarnation of the ethos of surrealism, where oh, passion... Uh, oh, uh, just, uh, Marisa is with COVID, so she can't speak because she is without voice. But she mm -hmm. wrote here, uh, do you want me to write, uh, to, to tell you the question? And to, yes, yes, you can she, tell. She, she said, uh, or can you, can you check, do you want me to? Wait, wait, let me see if I can. She said, aren't there also possibility, uh, possible relationships with the Arthurian hand that brandishes the Excalibur at the lake and also mm -hmm. Macbeth's bloody hands later on the play substituted by Lady Macbeth's blood, bloody little hands, all mm -hmm. of them can be read as disembodied objects that incarnate a libidinal investment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, I'm reading here. Mm -hmm. Of course, the land that King Arthur met is really disembodied, whereas in Macbeth, the hand is perceived as a strange object. But that's the belongs to the body of the truly killer. Well, I think we can make some relationship with Shakespeare, of course. Uh, but the relationship I'm trying to establish here with the Surrealists, the Surrealists, ha they have some, some references in medieval courtesan um, uh, reading literature, also with the romantic, the Schilling and the German first uh, movement of Romanticism. Uh, such as Novalis, and they have a lot of references in literature as well, and Baudelaire, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, all this Roman noir, or that we say this modit, um, modit poet, uh, this cursed poet, uh, Rambol, but I, I'm not, I don't have this lineage to Shakespeare, but of course we, we can do this relationship, and I, and I don't remember really quite well the play this moment where there is this a disembodied hand but the hand has this double meaning right it can be punishable it can punish you it can kill you and it can also protect you and also i think that's it's what hitchcock it's it's perceiving in and it's zizek is perceiving in hitchcock but we can talk more about that uh later on uh, thank you for the comments and but here I was talking about the woman and the femme d'année and how this woman that knows too much is presented, it's really repeats itself in Hitchcock and Tom. And it's also in a way in the topic of the surrealists. Uh, just to continue here, third motive, the Gothic house. Um, just a second, let me minimize this thing here, okay. Go back, 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 back. Okay, the Gothic house. So as I already uh, advanced a little bit, the Surrealists had the, these references in the horror genre of literature. So the house with a mystery that contained in its interior, a house full of shadows, silhouettes, a ghostly creature that inhabits the house. Uh, this is recurrent in like Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and it's a motif that repeats itself uh, in Hitchcock, according to Zizek, there's also this idea that the house that looks back at you, the objects that has a gaze that looks back uh, to, to the, the viewer and the spectator. So the house, it's kind of alive and it has a devilish uh, a spiritual being in, in, in the house. Uh, and the house in Psycho is inspired in the American painting House by the Railroad by Edward Hopper. And it's a Vic Victorian style house. Uh, a typical of the Gothic English 19th century literature. And it also became a stereotype of the haunted house also. I read that uh, many people in London don't like to, the, this type of house are never rented because they are so uh, in our unconscious of this, this stereotype of the haunted house and nobody wants to live in them <laughs> anymore. And it's also a reference for the Adams family series. It's the same house uh, in Hitchcock. The house windows will operate as eyes, as I, as I told already. The house incorporates the devilish spirits. And this image of the house remembered me. I, 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 I thought it was really similar to the Magritte's painting, this one here in the middle, that it's called Empire of Light, uh, which he explored the surrealist idea of compossibles. That means the union of 
opposites. So in this painting, at the same time, it's day and night. So which causes a strange temporal confusion, a feeling of strangeness. Again, this um, Heimlich feeling that this is not natural, this can't be, it's uh, inhuman, it's not natural to be day and light at the same time. And I, I, I thought there was some resemblance with rare window uh, scene here where you can, it's kind of a dusk uh, scene of the sunset, but it's strange. It's at the same time, it's orange and blue, it's night and day. So there is this uncanny uh, feeling towards houses, right? Uh, now the fourth motive, the what Zizek will argument as the concept of the constitution of the regard, that he different, differentiate regard from uh, uh, the look and the eye. Uh, this would have a relation with an external phantasmatic look that is an impossible subjectivity or a heretical theology, to use his words, what he co will call pre-ontological hell. Uh, there is a, th that means there is no uh, ontological being here. We, we are not looking at any uh, character perspective. There's no subjectivity. It's like a god eyes or a devilish eyes, something that it's outside uh, human perspective. So uh, it's an eye without a body or a spectator. So we can see these uh, scenes where the camera is up above here uh, in the bird scenes where there is an explosion. And also the second scene that is the scene of the moment the de detective is killed in cycle. And it's funny because Lucas has sent the TIFF uh, talk, the Q&A that Zizek participates. And I had selected this image be before seeing the Zizek talk. And he, he talks about this, exactly these two images, the birds and the cycle up, up, up in the sky point of view um, camera. So it's interesting. I, I imagine that he was really talking about these two scenes when he's, he, he says about this pre-ontological hell. So now uh, to, I'm finishing already and don't want to take too much time. Uh, so I instantly remembered when he, I read this idea of pre-ontological hell, the book uh, of Josh Bataille that's called The History of the Story of the Eye. Um, and I, I think we can establish uh, some relationships with the film cycle. Uh, Holland Bachs, he, will, he has a really interesting essay on, on George Bataille, the history of the eye. And it, he will state that the book is a metaf metaphorical or poetic composition of a single term, the eye. In Bataille's erotic narrative, through the surrealist procedure of free association, the eye will undergo variations of a certain number of substitute objects, which will maintain um, a close relationship of similar and however dissimilar objects. The first uh, variation of the eye in Bataille would be the egg, uh, because in French we also have this similar uh, words that oil and oeuf, oil, oeuf. Uh, these two words have a common sound, and although absolutely far apart, they are globular and they are white. So they have this plastic and formal characteristics. And these uh, formal characteristics allow new analogies and internal variation alongside the novel, such as the milk, that it's white, the mouth, that is round, cir other circular holes as the sun or the anus. So in this way, there is a kind of vocabulary or visual grammar uh, that is conceived by Bataille. For Barthes, as a verb, the I loses its condition as a noun, it's not a noun anymore, and it's declined as a verb, as inflectional forms of the same word, revealed as states of the same identity, extended as successive moments of the same story. So it's kind of a progression, a conceptual progression of the same idea. It is curious to see the cover of uh, different editions of Bataille's books. Uh, for example, this one here on the left, the letter O is rep replaced by a hole, a hole in the cover. So for Bataille, the I is configured as an elective zone of the body 
an organ that determines the power of both sedu seduction and horror. So the eye would condense these two uh, effects. The assumption of objects that become internal visual rhymes also occurs in the Hitchcock montage on the murder scene in Psycho, which follows the plastic hakor, the rounded shapes, and also based this same conceptual progression. There is a hole in the wall where Bates puts his eye on, where we can see the toilet, that is also a circular shape, the shower, again, a circular shape, Marion's mouth screaming, circular shape, the water drainage, Marion's eye, death, and I would say love here in the end, uh, they are all like connected erotisms. In Hitchcock as Bataille, he associated eros and tanatos, eroticism and death. Hitchcock takes the extreme seduction that touches the nerve of phobia and horror, the phobia of the disembodied eye or the disembodied hand, but the, the body that it's, um, uh, it's not in his organic state, right? There is the devil regard of pure emptiness, staring death at face. The drain is equivalent to the emptiness, the death, or in battalion terms, the lost continuity, or in terms of Zizek pre-ontological hell. We can also remember the word trauma derivates from the French for, for the word uh, who, who uh, and also Lucas, if you want to explain it well, I know that who it's like a neologism with traumatism that goes for the word trauma. Um, but well, it's interesting to see this idea of whole and trauma together. Uh, the drain is a whole for primordial nothingness, whole and whole. There is also this homophony in the English words, whole as a whole and whole. <laughs> uh, George Bataille formulates uh, his philosophy under three vertices, vertices that makes up his central argument, that is eroticism, death, and the mastery of forms. For Bataille, death approaches the being to the experience of the infinite, which belongs in essence to the sphere of the sacred, as in the idea of oceanic uh, experience that is in Freud, in religious experience, you have this uh, idea of dissoluting your ego in, with God. So, but I do, does this uh, relationship between sacrifice, death and love, all our sacred realms are in the same kind of experience. For Bataille, death is desired in its profound consequences, but I also state that love, and in particular the sexual act, are instances in which this subject can briefly experience a sense of continuity of the being. For Bataille, during these relational experiences, the subject forgets his primordial split with the rest of being and feels, again, this kind of continuity. Hitchcock used to say, film your murders as love scenes and your love scenes as murders. Is kind of interesting, right? Film, I will say again, film your murders as love scenes and your love scenes as murders. So just to conclude, uh, the shredded papers that are flushed down the toilet by Marion in psychosis uh, foresees the future, the murder. The woman body is an equivalent to the shredded papers. She, her body is what's left, the rest, the garbage or the litter or what Bataille calls the excess, who assassin. The evidence of the capital sin, though shall not steal and though shall not kill, uh, the body is this excess, what is left of the libidinal economy, the rest of the discharge or the flush of desire. In Hitchcock, crime seems to be the proof of the fall of man from Eden, condemnation that separates man from God. That is to say, in battalion terms, condemnation that condemns them to the discontinuity of beings, impossibility of reaching the sacred. It's the tendency to repeat Bates' murders, his symbiosis with his mother, that at the same time it's death, and Hitchcock's repetitions of symptoms could be seen as an attempt of fusion with a lost continuity that Bataille is referring to. That's a question I'm, I'm just... Uh, rhetorically posing. I finish with a provocative question. 
Was Hitchcock maybe looking for God when regarding death in the eye? Or was Hitchcock the last one of the romantics? So that's it, guys. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you. Um, you have the references here. Yeah, the references. Okay, thank you, Barbara. It was great. Um, I would just correct your translation um, to gaze instead okay. of uh, the regard. Regard. I don't, yes. you, you said it's regard, but normally we translate it as the gaze. Um, I would just make a connection between these two last. Um, uh, motives, uh, because you mentioned this pre-ontological place, uh, which the, um, the camera, the God's eye camera, tries to mimic. Um, and, and in the text of Zizek, he, he connects with these um, other images of the wall, of the emptiness of the, of the eye, of the bathtub uh, train, for example. Uh, and I think it's interesting to make this, um, this par parallel because um, this pre-ontological place actually is something that we cannot understand what it is, because as you said, it is not a subjective point of view. Um, we don't know which character, uh, um, from which character is that perspective. So we don't know, it's a, um, a mystery. Um, and at the same time, when we apply this idea to uh, what we are seeing in vertigo, for example, the connection between the eye and the bathtub drain, it's also the idea of void, of non-existence, of something that is meaningless. Um, and this is connected with this, what Zizek says about um, the place of the, the role of the woman as a, a subject of a non-entity of a, something that has no content, uh, but is filled in with the male fantasies. And I don't know, maybe this is just an interpretation that is too much, uh, but it's what Zizek says. Uh, I think he really he quotes um, Hitchcock because Hitchcock says, uh, the falling body, when the body falls, or when the, um, the, the nun appears in the last scene of Vertigo, we don't know where they come from. Uh, possibly they come from this pre-ontological place, and they have this ex machina uh, performative role, but it's something that escapes um, knowledge. And the, the connection with the, the nature of the woman, which is, as you know, um, uh, a strong presence in the films of, uh, of Hitchcock, uh, the role, the female roles, um, not for their importance for the, um, the narrative, but as corpse, as dead bodies. Uh, and I don't know if there is a connection between what we don't know, this preontological place, and the void and emptiness that is um, the, the essence or the nature of female characters, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I like that kind of, uh, of connection. Yeah, I think the surrealists are also a little bit, uh, they have this essentialist idea of a woman that is intuitive and very sensitive. Yeah. And it's also a male perspective on women, of course. But uh, they try to use uh, the power of women to con context and to disconstruct the bourgeois moral family. So they see women as something really disruptive for, it's like a, a revolutionary, revolutionary force. So, but of course there is this male gaze and I think Hitchcock, the, uh, Laura Mulvey writes about this uh, masculine and kind of, how do you say, misogynist? Uh, misogynist. It, yeah, misogynist way he, he puts women in, in scene. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, but I also read that uh, maybe this misogynist and narcissist perspective of Hitchcock could possibly be a disconstruction 
of the patriarchal <laughs> perspective. But I think, I don't know, maybe this is just absurd. I don't know what you think. Um, if you want to join the discussion. Uh, just uh, going with what you just said uh, about the, the women, isn't it? Uh, connecting with the last chapter and a question that Marisa asked uh, in this Lacanian diagram where you have the subject that is something that you don't reach in the psychoanalytical theory and in clinic and also the unconscious. So it is, it is this result of a division between something that is pre-ontological that's gonna meet language and then you're going to not be able to reach two stuff. This two stuff, is, it would be the subject not buried by language. So it'd be the subject as a pre-ontological thing and the unconscious. Because you can never actually reach the unconscious, you can reach the, the formal stuff that the unconscious sends to us. So you have the dreams and the, and the jokes and the symptoms. And then Lacan is going to play with the symptoms and make this structure with the phantom. So uh, when we go with Deleuze and Gattahi and the women being a minority uh, as the minor and the minor that is going to make you, make you able to speak a different language, a foreign language in the language that we came from. Uh, I don't know, listening to you, to you, guys, to you debating, uh, it makes me think like, uh, we cannot reach the unconscious, but Lacan in, in, uh, in one of his last seminars, he's gonna say that the unconscious is the woman. So there's no woman uh, as there is the man, as this, being, as this big thing that understands everything as the truth, as, as is something that is always able to be approached and understood, but there's the woman with the subversive potentialities of the woman. So Lacan goes with the post, uh, with the post structuralists in a way, and we can read Lacan with Deleuze and Gattari. So, and, and I put this, this little quote from Lacan that when he's gonna say that psychoanalysis should be understood as gay science. And, and he says that it's gay science because you don't have to always glue and understand everything with a lot of meaning. You have to fly by, you have to fly over and have the pleasure of deciphering. And that's pretty much uh, a Hitchcockian way of dealing with the suspense. It's not gonna be a, a, a truth of something, of someone, but it's gonna be something that you can reach in the unre unreachable, in the impossible. I don't know if I, I, I think it, it goes a little bit with what we are discussing here. Yeah, I think so. But I at the same time, don't you think that, um, these male, these male characters in Hitchcock are precisely the opposite of what um, the perfect ideal male is for the psychoanalysis, because they are um, they are cheated. They are uh, and this character of Scotty is from the beginning uh, misguided. So I don't know if this is not just a perversion of that kind of dynamics between male and female, because at the end, um, I don't know, the, these characters are not in possession of any um, truth or any uh, uh, a direct contact with reality, for example. Um, so it's the opposite, I don't know. And this this reminds me of what Zizek says right in the first lines of the text, uh, just to bring you specific to this um, to these first lines. He says that everything in a Hitchcock film has to have a meaning. But at the same time, at the end, we realize that um, there are some meaningless uh, elements in, in these films. For example, the death of, uh, of a sister is a meaningless death. So I'm just um, 
uh, don't know what you think, but um, if everything must mean something, uh, but except a woman's death, um, how, how to deal with this kind of um, interpretation? Because this is just an interpretation of what is happening in the film. And it has something that to do, to do with what Barbara mentioned in her presentation, which is the symptom, the jouissance, because if nothing has a specific meaning means that uh, it is just a playful, uh, it is a, I don't know, uh, do you know what I mean, Lucas? Uh, <laughs> but I, I kind of disagree that everything has a meaning there. <laughs> no? No. <laughs> I, for instance, if you go to the end of Psycho, we pretty much understand that he, he wants meaning at all because there's the doctor scene. And it's the doctor scene that the critics and people usually don't like. It is Rich Cox saying there's meaning there. This guy mm -hmm. was doing this because of that and that. But I don't know, it's everything so... But yeah, we have that explanation on Norman's mind and why he acts as he acts and so on. But at the same time, it's not a cause effect uh, relation. It's just an interpretation of um, the reason uh, behind uh, his, um, his own uh, decision or his acts. Uh, I don't know if um, Hitchcock is really trying to give us the keys to, uh, at the end of the film, have all the answer. Uh, Why is Marianne running with the money? because she didn't contact Sam. And they're talking about money in the first scene. No, we don't have money to get married or something, but she gets a bunch of money and she didn't go, oh, hey, let's, let's run to Mexico together. She simply runs, and why? <laughs> What's the meaning of that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Zizek said that uh, Marion in the middle of the film, it's kind of she regrets and she does the shower to, uh, cleans herself from her sin and she would decided to give back the money and then she's killed out of nothing like god doesn't forbid her she is there is not no morality here that it, it doesn't matter if she decides she is regrets she will die anyway like so in this yeah. way it's Susanna saying there is no like morality he it, it seems like he hitchcock thinks there is no God, like that, that's the meaning. The, everything is random. Like the birds, the birds is a film that I saw when I was a kid, I think I was uh, a teenager. And it really dis disturbed me because there is no explanation why the birds are killing everybody. They just started killing everyone. <laughs> so, and you say really, you know, it's a really uneasy, it can happen. Maybe one day birds will start killing us. So <laughs> it's, I think that this is the uncanny in, in Hitchcock, right? There is no meaning. Like yeah, I, I agree with you. It's kind of scary why we don't even know um, what, what are the reasons for the birds to attack people because it's not a virus, it's not a revenge. We never know, it just happens. Um, we, can, we can see it as a metaphorical um, uh, image of what is happening between the humans, of course, but it really is not an, a good explanation. It's just random. <laughs> and that is upsetting. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it comes to mind. It, it really much comes to mind. Uh, the leftovers, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> kind because of, the, yeah. you, you don't understand why and there's no actually actual reason for that. Yeah. But there's one chapter in season T that they call season two that they call Nora Durst. And they it's it's like researchers from a famous university, and there's they are talking to her. Uh, we we discovered that maybe since your whole family vanished and you are the only one that is still here, maybe you are a lens. And lens is not any any word, it's a lens, so something that you can see the word with. Yeah. And a lens means that she could be the, I don't know, uh, connection between the earth and a devil. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. That's the university calling her, science, science is calling her. So I don't know, there's no meaning, but yeah. we're building up meaning. 
and we were trying like to... a superior force or something but really uh, unreachable uh, but that, that's exactly what happens in leftovers because they, they can try to look for reasons and explanation but at the end they they just have to deal with uh, what happened and do not look back but look forward um, yeah and, and also, uh, sorry, I was thinking that North by Northwest and also International Intrigue, the two stories, it's about complete randomness. Like the guy is mistaken by another guy. He is mistaken for a spy and he's put like in a death spiral and he must fight for his life out of complete nowhere. So it's like a Kaf Kafkaian stories, like randomness. You can be put in your life in a, at stake out of nothing <laughs> for being in the wrong place in the wrong hour so that's a really hitchcock mindset you know <laughs> and also talking about masculinity and seeing that marisa also wrote something about it here uh it's very interesting that gus van sen is gonna make the remake and that's that's the bizarre remake that is a a a, a bad remake but i think it's it should be shouldn't be seen as like cinema. It should be seen as contemporary art, because I, I was trying to. I, I saw it again two one week ago or two weeks ago, and I was trying to see it as I was trying to I don't know see Cindy Sherman's untitled film stills, because Gusman is playing with the with the motives, and he's putting the he, Gusman is this gay guy making camp and queer cinema sometimes, and also Hollywood films in, in another way, but uh. Uh, I think it's brilliant that he decides as an act to, 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 to remake Hitchcock, and especially when we think about masculinity, because there, there is the, the tramp stamp from, Hugo, uh, from, from Viggo Mortensen that I was, I was talking to Susanna. They were, they are talking about stamps in the first scene, and then there is a nude from Viggo Mortensen. That there's no nude in the original Psycho. Uh, there's only the shower nude, but then he puts a, a male nudity, and they're talking about stamps. Oh, if I get the money, I have to, you're gonna send this, this letter with the money to my wife and you're gonna lick the stamp. He's, tell, he's telling Marion, but Viggo Mortensen is naked and he has a tramp stamp. And I mean, it's, it's very funny because it's camp and it's bizarre, but I think he's talking about this masculinity, this twisted masculinity from Hitchcock, I don't know. And you know, Lucas, um, after we, we talk about that remake, because I, I don't like it, I cannot <laughs> like it, but I was reading something about uh, the reasons why Vincent made this remake and the small difference that it puts in. And I don't know if this is Vincent himself talking, but he said that Hitchcock wanted to uh, put some images of the breasts of the female breast, but he couldn't, of course, because of censorship. And so Gens Vincent translate or transform that uh, images of the breasts into the Vigos Mortisons, but because he could, he could show us Vigo Mortisons, but <laughs> I don't know, maybe this is just a joke and has no uh, profound meaning or uh, I don't know, maybe just a joke. I, I also read that it was prohibited by the censorship to show to toilets <laughs> in, in the 1950s. It was forbidden to show a sanitary toilet. And hit, just Hitchcock showing that scene where she shred the papers, it's really transgressive, like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, just to, uh, for us to, to, to to get like uh, from one chapter to the other, it's very interesting how 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 the the original book, the Zizek Lacrimae, is built. Because we have the first chapter, and we are talking about this theological materiality, and you're call, and he's calling the Lacrimae Redum concept that is fiction building a communal, a social, a social way of being together. So that's the symbolic that's gonna build up. And the second chapter is the master of this, is Hitchcock. I mean, even if there's no meaning, even if there's just like flying by a, a deciphering, 
Hitchcock is the, the filmmaker that's going to, in a way, teach modern cinema how to do that. And he's the most popular one. And Truffaut is going to interview him for the French. So I, I was playing, I sent you guys an email because I was playing with this idea of the true, that is the, the from the true matism that Lacan is going to build up the word, and also the true from the whole, that is in the end, when the subject meets the, uh, the language, uh, we're gonna have something that falls from us that we are gonna lose forever. We are gonna say that the libido has to work that way so we can, as humans, reproduce. So we have to, to have the symbolic structure of a myth that is Oedipus to, to organize our lives here together. So there is a whole that is produced in this dealing with language, with being humans. And uh, Truffaut is a, is, a, is a whole and is the fake that is the full. So we have to build narratives. We have to build what is fake there to, to, to try to organize our lives. So I think it's very interesting that that's the second chapter from the book because the first one is dense and difficult. But the second one is already saying, oh, there is this way. That's how filmmakers understood how filmmaking is. I don't know, that was my reading of it. Yeah. I don't know if you guys want to comment on it. Uh, if anyone uh, would like to share something with us, just <laughs> don't be shy. <laughs> and look, at the next uh, chapter will be on Tarkovsky and will be on the inner space. So I don't know what this is, what will happen. <laughs> but I think it's a, a line of thought uh, here to be followed. And by the way, is anyone um, really willing, willing, willing to deal with uh, David Lynch, uh, with uh, Tarkovsky uh, in the next session? You can bring anything, even if it's yeah. an image. You don't have to talk 20 minutes. It's just because it's interesting if somebody, oh, I can do that. Or, otherwise, we can present something, but uh, even a line is possible. <laughs> no. Okay, um, better. Go, go, go. Hi. Um... I have something to add. I think first, this is a really beautiful presentation. And there's, I don't think that I can add something like of substance to it uh, or even ask a question, but I wanted to just take one kind of line of thought. Uh, I want to share some um, pictures here. Can I share my screen? Uh, well, wait a second, uh, Max. Um... I need to be made a core presenter or something. Yeah. You, you can go. So for um, Saika, I've been, I've been thinking about the swamp, which the swamp where the car got uh, disposed of, right? So and there is interesting, Swamp has a character of its own in a way. And it's interesting that the last shot of the film, it, it ends with Swamp with a car getting unearthed out of the swamp. So this is the last shot, the end with the car. It's an interesting shot. There is a chain directed right, right at us or like at some angle uh, towards us. And there is a close shot of the car the front of the car right and then i was thinking like what kind of a role does swamp adds to this and also there is an interesting gesture that when there is a long take when the um car gets down and then it gets stuck and then norman waits for it and he is in doubt of, and he is anxious like he th thinks if it's really gonna get down or drown completely or would it get stuck like with a part sticking out and he makes this hand gesture so i was thinking about the 
uh, the role of hand gestures as Hitchcock's style. So it's an interesting, what does this gesture represent? I mean, psychologically, we understand what it means. So he is in doubt and he is expecting to, he has anxiety about what's going to happen to him as a murderer, basically. But he also like has this anxiety in the moment of thinking, is it really going to get down? Or do I need to do something more like to push it down? Which is an interesting kind of uh, symbolic sequence between the scene of uh, murder and then uh, uh, this swamp consuming the body. And I was looking through some pictures here in just Google results for Psycho Swamp. And there's this beautiful uh, kind of image of somebody imagining what is actually happening like from the perspective of the swamp. So uh, we were talking about this pre-ontological health of perspectives that do not exist, do not represent any uh, being. So this is a perspective of the swamp, which is like somebody really put in work like to, to make this image, which is uh, amazing. I think there is some other like all kinds of stuff is happening there and there's some other people there's a lot of detail there's somebody like imagining and there's norman bates and then there's a house uh on top which is an interesting kind of take on what you can imagine with plain not just inscribing perspectives inside the shots in the movie that we already have but imagining new perspectives I so, think the, the yeah. shadow over there is Hitchcock, the the shadow of a man here. Oh, this uh, you mean? It seems, it seems to be. Yeah, his. yeah, 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 yeah. I thought about it too. It kind of has his body shape, but there is a lot of other stuff here too. So, uh, I think this is a beautiful exercise. Yeah, that's what I wanted to add. It's like a tangent, but. I think it could be interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That's great, yes. Well, uh, yeah, we don't have to understand everything from the text, but I think we, we pretty much talked about a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Of course, uh, if anyone wants to share anything on the mailing, or if anyone wants to talk about their cubs for the next session, you can contact me or Susanna and it's good. And uh, with the handling, it comes to mind the, the, the fourth da concept from Freud in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, because it is the, the baby, the, the, little child, the little kid that is Freud's grandson and he's playing with the spinning top. So when the mom leaves the house, the, the kid is gonna throw, throw the spinning top and take it back and Freud is going to organize this concept of fort da. And fort da is pretty much living no investment. It is pretty much handling the objects that are not yourself. So in our lives, we, 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 we invest with libido in other objects. And having this handling of the objects is pretty much being neurotic. That's what Norman is not able to do because the mom is always there like, looking what you're doing. So the mom from that is actually Freud's daughter, she's leaving the house and what the kid does when the mom is not there. So the kid is playing with this moment uh, and with the handing, the handling of the things, I think it, uh, it's, not, uh, it, it's, it's not for nothing that Hitchcock uses the hand a lot. And that was great that you showed this to us, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think we we can finish with it. With yeah. it. Ah, but we, before, before yeah, good. we need to <laughs> we need to decide um, in which day um, we will meet again. Uh, we will make a pause in August. Okay, so everyone will get some time off to read and see a lot of movies. Um, and we came back again in September. And Lucas, we've thought about um, the fifth 
the fifth and the seventh seventh of September, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you guys prefer the seven, the five, or the uh, seven? I I would like to present something uh, about Tarkovsky. Uh, okay. Uh, but um, not nothing very special, but, but I think it would, would be uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, once uh, the next session will be only in September, I think it, it will be, uh, I will have some time to study and explore. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very Sophia. much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. everything that uh, by reading the text or rewatching the film that touches you, like where your desire goes with the images there, you, it's, it's very welcome here. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Marisa said that she she likes the seven. For me, is what do you guys prefer? So let's have the seven. Good. I, I agree. If if no one says anything, it's because I agree. So <laughs> seven is okay for me. Yeah. Okay. The so seven. we have the seven. Okay. Good. Um, Good. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. The seventh is fine. Thank everybody. Yeah, so so we have the seventh. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, see, uh, Evie said that also wanted to to talk a little bit about nostalgia. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. So we have you both, Sophia and Evie, to okay. present in the beginning of the session, and then after it we we talk. The first chapter was tough because it was 150 pages. Mm -hmm. The other chapters are smaller. So you we can close read if you guys say, oh, let's go to this line or that line or that paragraph, we can read together. So bring it here. It's it's very good. Yeah, but okay. you are free to bring uh, free associations, other images from painting like Barbara uh, did today. It would be great just to open up the the vision. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, the importance here is to free associate and try <laughs> to produce something something out of out of this meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, so um, I thank you all, um, and we'll see you again in September. Okay. Anything, please write. You got our email, so don't be shy. Okay. And we have the same link. It's always the same Zoom. It's always the same, yes. See you next time. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.